final speaker is the winningest coach in Big Ten basketball history. He's won three NCAA titles and a conference record, 11 Big Ten titles. Besides those crowns, he was also coach of the 1984 gold medal winning Olympic team. Indiana head coach Bob Knight. And, and, the, mo and the most recent thing... And the most recent thing that we've done is getting our ass beat by Boston College in the NCAA. That's, uh, that's the last thing. When I came uh, here in 1971, I got a telegram from the Indianapolis Alumni Association. You know, that's our largest alumni body in the world. I got the telegram framed, and it's been behind my desk since I think it was the 2nd of April, 1971. The telegram goes like this. Coach Knight, congratulations on being named head coach of our alma mater. We're with you all the way, winter time. And it has been essentially like that for 25 years. I mean, there is nobody. That gets more, I get more help than Governor Bai gets in this state. I mean, nobody has more assistance than I've got. Now, let me tell you what the hell I'm going to do for people in Indiana this year. And I, everybody wants to leave a mark on something. Everybody wants to leave a mark on what they do. I don't care what it is. A florist wants to leave a particular strain of a road. A uh, composer wants to leave a song for eternity. A coach wants to leave a mark on the game that he coaches. Well, I've got that this year. We're going to put a new scoreboard in Assembly Hall. And it's going to be a great thing. And, and I, I'll get to its purpose in a moment. But prior to that, you know, I think that, that you've got to involve people in what the hell it is that you're doing. Your people, your players, refer to those people that are in your business or in whatever you do as your players. I'll talk in, in athletic terms. You got to get them involved. And, and once in a while, I'll come home. And, you know, one time, there's a little old lady sitting across the floor from me or standing and was kind of crowded and... I threw her my chair, and I got in all kinds of trouble over that. <laughs> and, and I'll come home, and, and my wife will say, well, you're kind of down. I mean, you, you, you don't seem up. You don't seem ready. You don't seem like we played as well as we I thought we played pretty well tonight. I said, you know, there's a guy that was hollering at me from behind, and, and I couldn't hear what it was that he wanted. And, and I said, I know that he went home thinking I didn't pay any attention to what he wanted, and, and I'm really sorry because I always try to do what the fans want. And, and I always try to get involvement from our people in games. So we borrowed a little thing from the Catholic Church, and I kind of like this. You know, on the back of all the pews where the Catholics keep the bingo cards, we're going to put in... We're going to put in half-court and full-court diagrams. And any time you're at a game, how many of you have been to a game in Assembly Hall? Well, this year when you go to a game, if you got a suggestion, and it gets noisy and sometimes I can't hear all your suggestions. And I feel badly when I can't. You put your little suggestion down on half-court or full-court diagram, whichever is pertinent, and we got people in every section that'll collect them, take them down to the little table we're going to have behind the scorer's table. Three people in really spiffy uniforms, and you gals will really be impressed with this. The chairperson every night is going to be a lady, because I just figure she knows a hell of a lot more about how to get things done quickly than most men do. So we're going to put her there in charge, and the three people are going to look at all the suggestions. And when they find one that they vote on three to nothing for me to impl implement in the game, 
the chair lady hit the button and a bell goes off on my chair if it's still there. And I just get up and call time. Get the suggestion, get down, go through the suggestion for the players. Players are gonna go out on the floor and put into play what this fan has suggested. And as the players walk out, the scoreboard, my new scoreboard, which will be my mark on basketball, is going to flash the section, the row, and the seat number of the person who's made the suggestion. And the other 18,000 can get on his ass, not on mine. So I think, I do think that you've got to get people involved in what you're doing. You've got to get your players involved. Now, I'll get into that a little bit later. I think there are two things that we talk about and think about when we involve ourselves with management, with administration, with teaching, with coaching, with leadership. We, we talk about, I think, what is it that the leader has to do? What, what does the leader have to be? And then what is it that the leader has to do? What does the manager have to do to get the players to play? And you've had a lot of people that have been very, very successful, not just with individual and personal success here today, five people, that have been able to get other people to do things. I told LaRussa that one of the things he should have done was to have got Eckersley to throw that pitch a little bit lower against the Dodgers in the World Series that Gibson hit out to start the A's to getting beat. And LaRussa turned around and said to me, I think you should have got Evans to move more without the ball in the Boston College game last year. So that was all the advice I had for anybody that came up here. But if you're going to manage, there are some things that I think we all have to do. I think you have to do. I think I have to do. And as other people have talked about uh, different facets of what success is all about. I'm going to direct my remarks here this afternoon and then let you question me in any way that you would like relative to, to management. You know, you're going to do something, whatever it is, where you want 70% results. You've got to get 70% results in whatever it is that we're doing, let's say. Just pick that as a figure. Well, if we want 70% results, we can't take 40% shots. We've got to be able to, to get our people to take 70% shots. And one of the things that I've always tried to do is let my players know just what the hell it is that I want from them. I, I had a, a friend of mine, actually was a coach whose team I played against years ago as a college player at Ohio State, December of 1960 in fact. George Ireland was a coach at Loyola Chicago. And those of you that are real basketball fans and maybe as old as I am would remember that Loyola beat Cincinnati in the NCAA championship game in 1963, and George was the coach. And years later, maybe just seven or eight years ago, George Ireland brought his grandson to my basketball camp. And he said, Bob, I've enjoyed watching Indiana play since I've been retired. I've become a real fan, and I've got something that I want to give to you because I'd like to give you something that I can feel would be something of a help to you in Indiana basketball. And he gave me a card. And on the card, he had written the word assume. And he had hyphenated that word into A-S-S -S hyphen U hyphen M-E. He said, I just wanted you to have something 
that I've had with me for 47 years as a teacher and or a coach. When you assume that your players know something, you're in the process of making an ass out of you and me. And so I thought I'd always kind of adhere to this sort of philosophy before George gave me that card. But I like graphic explanations, and that was a little bit more graphic than any way I had phrased it, and I like that. And, and I think that, that what we have as managers, more than anything else, is an obligation to our players to give them everything that we've got. Too many times I think, God damn it, he didn't give us what he can give us. He didn't, well, are we giving them what we can give them? Are we giving everything we've got to manage in this operation? Are we giving everything we've got to coaching this team? And that's what I want to talk about here this afternoon. I use two sets of words with our players. Look and see and hear and listen. Let me take the first two words. Look and see. I think it's really important that we see. I think it's important that we're observing. Sherlock Holmes said to his companion, Dr. Watson, Watson, everybody sees but very few perceive. And I kind of change that a little bit for our players. I say simply, you know, you guys all look, but sometimes you don't see anything. When you look, you got to see. I had a great player from here in Indianapolis named Whitman. He played at Ben Davis High School out on the west side. Now, Whitman's mother always thought he was a little better than I did, but Whitman, nevertheless, was a hell of a basketball player and a really good kid, one of the best players I've ever had. We're practicing one day, and I'm standing at midcourt while practice is moving up and down in front of me. We're scrimmaging. And Whitman has the ball, and he's coming to midcourt. And it's always interesting to try and think as your players do and then see how many times your players don't quite think that way. I think, all right, Whitman's coming to midcourt. He's going to cross midcourt. We're going to get the ball into play. Here's Blop. Uwe Blop was a really good kid. Very, very smart kid. 5 Beta Kappa. Spoke four languages. I wish he'd have been a little dumber and had better hands. I mean, he couldn't catch it then, today, or tomorrow, except in real certain situations. A couple of years ago, Uwe was playing in the Italian Pro League, and I got a fax from his wife. Their first child was born, a boy. Uwe, 7'2", 265 pounds. Wife was a beautiful girl, 6'1". Baby was a boy, 4 feet 3, weighed 102 pounds. I mean, this is a big damn kid. So I get this fax about the baby being born, and I send Uve's wife a fax back, congratulating her on the birth of the son. Hope mother and son are both well. I put a P.S. Don't ever let your husband hold that kid over anything but a bed. <laughs> Does not have good hands. <laughs> Whitman comes to midcourt. Really smart player. The mental is to the physical as four is the one. Give me a kid that thinks, give me a kid that thinks, give me a kid that thinks. I don't need a kid that jumps, I need one that thinks. Whitman thinks, I think. He comes to midcourt, block breaks to the basket. Whitman looks, but he doesn't see. Because off the dribble, he makes a perfect pass to Block. He's going to hit him right here. All Uwe has to do is catch it and dunk it. But I know, and Whitman knows when he looks up and sees, 
and Blop himself knows as the ball is coming to him that he ain't going to catch it. <laughs> and it goes through his hands out of bounds. Well, I'm not at all upset with this because I know Blop cannot catch this pass. Whitman's a senior. He was red-shirted. He's been there for five years. Now, my players have a tendency as they progress through school to give me shorter and shorter answers to my questions. And they found that the least they can say, the fewer problems they're going to have. And in fact, Buckner, when he was a senior, made a great, uh, had a great skill at just nodding his head one way or the other in answer to my questions. He was the best. So as the ball goes through Blop's hands, I walk out on the court and I say to Whitman, Whitman, how long have you been here? Five years. How many of those five years have you played with Blop? Two. Have you ever seen him catch that pass? No. Nope. <laughs> Do you ever think he'll catch that pass? No. Nope. <laughs> then Whitman, let me tell you, Without any reservation, you've proven yourself to be today the dumbest son of a bitch I've ever had play here. <laughs> so with those words of encouragement, I went back to the sideline. And we continue to play. See. See, Whitman. See. Don't just look. See what the hell is out there. Well, you know, I'm always kind of intrigued with guys that pray to see the ball better or they say that the Lord helped them make that putt does that mean the Lord screwed everybody else I don't know uh, I'd rather the guy took good pitches and I'd rather think the guy lined up his putt well you know I want the Lord working on homes for the homeless and a cure for cancer he doesn't need to be screwing around with putting and, and, and sliders and things but if he does have an interest in sports it's got to be basketball. <laughs> Inside, warm, enthusiasm, girls, boys, old, young. I mean, his whole universe is there in front of him. So I really believe that when he takes a moment of rest, it's probably watching a basketball game. And every once in a while, there's evidence of that. And that day was one of those days. Because about three plays later, here comes Whitman up the court. And I'm standing back, and I see the whole thing unfold, and so help me, Blop is in the same position, going to the bucket. Now, I know that with Whitman's past experience and what I've talked about, he's going to see. It isn't going to be a look and a pass. He's going to see. And I envision Whitman coming to midcourt, bringing the ball across midcourt, coming into play, setting up our offense, Blop posts. We hit Blop with a pass that he can catch. He turns and scores. I envision all of this. But as Whitman crosses midcourt, he again sees a flash of red and makes a pass off the dribble. Now this time he looks up a little quicker than he did the pass time. And as the ball is leaving his hand, he sees that the ball is intended for Blop once again. I've never had a player do this either before or since. Whitman actually dies after he's passed. <laughs> trying to bring it back. And he reacted so quickly that, so help me, he got a finger on the ball. But the pass continued. So I again know, right through Uwe's hands. But again, I'm surprised. Uwe is running. And he just watches the ball sail out of bounds. No effort made whatsoever to stop this pass. So I kind of momentarily forget about Whitman. And I walk out on the floor. I say, don't move, Whitman. Just wait there. And I go to Uwe. And I say, Uwe, you know, I don't expect you to catch that pass. You don't think you're going to catch it. But how about maybe 
putting your hands together and smacking it back in bounds. <laughs> or get your shoulder in the way. Or, or maybe we can keep possession. Uve 7 1, 260, four languages, fluent English, slight German accent, looks down at me and says, Coach, I agree with you. Rudet Mittman is the dumbest son of a bitch that's ever played in Indiana. <laughs> And I just want you to know that if he is so dumb as to throw me that pass a second time, I am much too smart to try and catch it the second time. <laughs> Look and see. I think the manager has got to be able to see. The manager's got to be observed. He has to see the game. And he's got to get players to see the game. He's got to get the players to understand strengths and weaknesses. I have to understand strengths and weaknesses. Hell, I'd like everybody to be able to be a good three-point shooter. I'd like them all to shoot from three-point range. But you know, we got a kid that he's missed three straight threes. And I'm sitting at home the other day, and my wife is reading an article in a magazine. And I look over and I say, Karen, what do you read? She said, well, and she was a teacher for 20 years, so she's obviously interested in education and educational theories. And she said, you know, there are a lot of studies now being made that the whole psychological approach to education that we've taken in the last 10 years has had a real negative effect on our kids. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, all of this positive reinforcement, no matter what Susie's done, we pat Susie on the back. No matter how ineffective Johnny's been, we just keep telling Johnny to keep on, Johnny. We don't get on anybody anymore. And studies have shown that this has really hurt our kids and that there has to be a swing back to telling people when they've made a mistake to being more demanding, not accepting whatever is thrown out there at us. And she kind of looked at me and smiled and said, you've hung on long enough that you're back in style. Because <laughs> see, when that kid has just missed three or four threes in a row, it's never been quite my style to go out and say, hey, Johnny, I know you've missed four straight. Two of them have been bad shots. One was questionable, but that doesn't make any difference, Johnny. I want you to do your thing. You know, if you think you should take another four shots before you... You go right ahead, Johnny. I've never been quite able to bring myself to that. You know, I would rather say something like, Johnny, let me tell you something. One more miss three and you're dead. <laughs> That's kind of been my approach to things over the years. I want Johnny to be able to listen. Next to see and look is listen and hear. We've got to be able to get our players to listen to what we're talking about. I think that's a prime requisite in managing anything. Getting people to listen. We have a timeout with 30 seconds to play, national championship game, Indiana against Syracuse, 1987. New Orleans, the Superdome. We've just scored to get within a point. Syracuse has the ball out of bounds on our baseline. Here's what I said in the timeout. We've got the foul Coleman. Coleman is about a $7 million a year guy that couldn't shoot free throws then or now. I'd rather be paying it to somebody that could shoot free throws. We've got to foul Cole. As soon as he gets the ball, we've got to try and get it as it's on the way to him. And if we can't, we've got to get a piece of Coleman and get him on the line. And we talked about two or three kids Syracuse had that were good free throw shooters 
that we don't want to put on the lot. So after having gone through this at the time out, Syracuse to a great extent kind of thwarts everything that we've planned because Coleman takes the ball out of bounds. And it's kind of tough to follow a guy out of bounds. Now, they have a kid named Sykley, the center, who flashes up and gets the pass. Well, we immediately come off, off Coleman and double-team Sykley. Steve Isle came off Coleman, went after Sykley. Sykley makes a really good play at least seemingly, and returns the ball to Coleman who stepped in bounds and is now open. Don't just hear, listen. Keith Smart comes off his man as the pass is being made to Coleman and almost gets the pass, almost intercepts it at the basket. And in trying for the interception, fouls Coleman when he can't get it because he listened to what we wanted done at the timeout. Coleman goes to the line, he misses the one and one, Keith Smart eventually hits a 15-foot shot that wins a national championship for us and it wasn't the shot that made the difference, it was the play that Smart made on Coleman that put him on the free throw line and only took two seconds. We had 28 seconds left to do something. So we start with, I think if we're going to manage, if we're going to administer, if we're going to teach, if we're going to coach, if we're going to motivate, we start with getting our people to see what's going on and to listen to what it is that we want done. I'm going to talk, as I said, about those things that I think go into successful leadership. And the first is discipline. I think any of us that are going to be in positions of leadership or positions of management have got to be disciplined people. Now, discipline takes a lot of different forms. There have been seemingly undisciplined people who are very disciplined. And people that you would think are extremely disciplined who aren't. I think there are four ingredients that a disciplined person carries with him at all times, and they are these. The disciplined person does what has to be done. X has to be done, the disciplined person does it. And he does it when it has to be done. What and when? What have I got to do? When have I got to get it done? And thirdly, the disciplined person does it as well as it can be done. You know, I, I sure as hell don't play golf as well as it can be played because I don't have to. You know, I get a little bit irritated when I hit a bad shot or miss an easy putt or I hang a fly up in the pine tree behind me. No, but I don't have to do those things. I, I don't subscribe to the theory that you do everything as well as it can be done because I don't think that's humanly possible. But I for damn sure think that when it comes to business, when it comes to what you're getting paid to do, you're trying to do it as well as it can be done. I try to coach as well as I can coach all the time. I don't try to fish as well as I can fish all the time because it isn't necessary to do that. And the fourth thing that the disciplined person does, I think, he tries to do it as well as it can be done and he tries to do it that way all the time. Four things that if we're going to manage successfully, I think we have to start with, if we're going to lead successfully, are these four ingredients that go into discipline. My definition of discipline. Do what has to be done, when it has to be done, as well as it can be done, and do it that way all the time. 
If we're doing that, then we've set an example for our players. Last night, I had a little team meeting. And because of some things that came up, I was 20 minutes late. Well, I'm not late to meetings, and I don't want anybody else being late to meetings either. And sometimes when players are late to meetings, there are some consequences to suffer. Well, I know the players, although I have had a couple in the past that would have, and I would have certainly accepted it. But these players that I have are still trying to find themselves a little bit. And I know the players aren't going to say anything to me for being 20 minutes late last night. So I did it for them. I walked in and I said, okay, guys, I'm going to tell you something. I'm 20 minutes late. Look at my watch. I say, now you know that if any one of you had been 20 minutes late here tonight, there'd be hell to pay. So here's the deal. In all probability, at some time, when practice starts this fall after the 15th of October, I'm going to be a little bit irritated with all of you. I said, and I look at Patterson, and I said, would you accept that as a pretty good probability? <laughs> and Patterson looked up and said, Coach, based on the last two years, I'd say it's a definite probability. <laughs> I said, okay, here's what you get out of my being 20 minutes late. When I put you on the end line, the first time to run sprints because I'm irritated at your effort, your performance, at whatever it is, somebody just simply say to me, Coach, you told us when you were late at our meeting in June that we would not have to run the first set of sprints you put us in. And you won't have to run them. That's what you get for me being late. And I said, now, is there anybody here who will make sure that you tell me that? No matter how irritated I am, <laughs> when I put you on the baseline and tell you that we're going to run sprints. And again, Patterson looked at me and grinned, and he said, don't worry, coach, we'll have Charlie tell you. <laughs> but I want them to be able to feel to a certain degree that they are a real part of what we're doing. And it just occurred to me that when I went in there late that I needed to punish myself a little bit because they weren't going to do it, but I needed to show them that I was wrong. Now, Keep in mind, I didn't go so far as to say that I would run sprints. <laughs> but I gave them something. I like to think that it's important that they understand that it's not my team, it's our team. Whatever the team is, it's sales, it's research, it's marketing, it's promotion, Whatever my team is, it really is our team. And because I'm the leader, I've got to make sure that they know that it's our team. That, that they know that we're all involved in this together. After discipline, I think that a leader needs to be inquisitive. I think a leader needs to be searching for answers. I think a leader always needs to be looking to improve his team. I had six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names were what, where, and when, how, why, and who. The inquisitive person, I think, simply puts himself in a position where he's always trying to find out something, where he's always trying to find a better way of doing it. Let's build a better mousetrap. How the hell do we do it? 
what, where, when, how, why, who. An effective leader, I think, has got to be inquisitive. I think that above all else, he's got to want to know what can we do to make this better? What is there that we can do? I, I really like to ask our players. This is an area where I really involve our players. Hey, I take an experienced player that's going to play. I take a Calvert Cheney, and I say, Calvert, who does the best job of getting the ball to you? Calvert, who do you feel most comfortable playing with when the other team's in a zone? Sometimes I ask questions where I really don't particularly care about the answer because I know what I want to do, but I just want a little input so he or they think they have some input into it. Other times, what they say is what we're going to do. Calvert, I don't know whether we should start Smith or Jones. What do you think? Coach, I think Jones should start. Okay, Jones is going to start. Now I know that Calvert's got a little on the line here. He's going to help Jones a little bit. Calvert knows that it was his decision to start Jones. We're not going to. I mean, don't let me mislead you. Basketball at Indiana is not America's most democratic operation. I got it digress just a moment and tell you something I think you'll all get a kick out of because I think more and more we become apolitical but I was at a pretty large gathering like this not too long ago and it had a very very strong Republican flavor to it that I couldn't miss and nor could anyone and I said to the gathering I said you know some of you are going to be pleased to hear this but I have come to the conclusion as I've studied a lot of things over the past years that the second most ineffective institution in American history is the National Democratic Party. Of course, with the Republican flavor, everybody kind of got a kick out of that until I said, now some of you aren't going to like this, but it's only superseded in effectiveness by the National Republican Party. So I, I get into some things with with players. I get into things with players where maybe what they say is going to have no bearing on what we do, but the player knows that he's had something and I've at least asked and my decision or my choice wasn't his, but he got something to put into it. And then maybe, as is the case with Cheney and Jones, his thought and his decision was the answer. I want players to have an input, particularly in the things that I really don't care about. But I don't want to let them know that I don't care about it. I think this is really an interesting area of leadership. We're going to practice on Saturday. Okay? A weekday's practice is determined by our class schedule. But we're going to practice on Saturday. You've got to have a meeting. Whatever it is, it's going to be in a time slot that really doesn't make any difference to you. So why, as the manager, as the leader, as the superintendent, as the CEO, why should I pick the time? Doesn't make any difference to me. Okay, guys, we're going to practice on Saturday. After you shower, Calvert, come tell me what time you want to practice Saturday. I think involving your players in decisions does two things. As I've said, it, number one, puts them in a position where, hey, this is our team. You know, coach told us to make up our minds when we're going to practice on Saturday. And secondly, it makes them responsible for something. They got to make a decision. 
In 1992, we go to the NCAA Final Four in Minneapolis, and I had become really irritated with our two senior captains, Anderson and Meeks. I told the team that Anderson and Meeks would not be our captains in the NCAA tournament. You come to me with who the captains are going to be. Boy, were they reluctant to do this. You know, Anderson and Meeks were their buddies. Anderson and Meeks were guys they'd played with for two or three years. Anderson and Meeks have been really stuck in the butt with something. They're not going to be captains. They at first kind of thought they could get out of it by not making a decision. Cheney comes to me. Coach, you know, Eric and Jamal have been our captains. You know, we're, we're, we're happy to have them as captains in the NCAA. I said, well, Calvert, I goddamn am not happy to have them as captains in the NCAA. And I have a little sign in our locker room that says, when the coach ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> and I said, so Calvert, you get your ass back in there and you come back to me with the captains. So reluctantly, Calvert and Greg Graham come trundling out. And now they are going to be our captains. And neither one really wants to be. And then, so we get going from there. Now we go through the first round of the NCAA and we beat Eastern Illinois and, and LSU. And now we beat Florida State in the third game in a tough game down in Albuquerque. And we're having a meeting on Friday afternoon. Wayne Lucas is at the meeting. We're having a meeting on Friday afternoon about practice for Saturday's game with UCLA. We've gone to a local high school to go through what it is that we're going to go through for the UCLA game, walk through, talk about it, show what we have to do on offense, show what we have to do on defense. Then we came back to the hotel and now we've got the players in a room and we have a time to go work out at the University of New Mexico arena in the afternoon. So I've got the players. Okay, do you want to go work out? We can go over and run and shoot, work out, and right away meets. Coach, I think we should go work out. Anderson, coach. I think so too. We shouldn't pass up the chance to go work out. Calvert, what do you think? Coach, I don't feel like working out. I don't think we should. Said, my leg bothers me a little bit. Greg, what do you think? Coach, I'm tired. I don't need to work out anymore. We went through what we did this morning, and that's all we need to do. We're going to be all right. We don't need any more workout. Halftime of the UCLA game, we're ahead by 15 points. With about 30 seconds to go, I'm saying to myself, I got to get Cheney when the, when the gun goes to end the half at the corner of the arena in Albuquerque. Were any of you at that game by any chance? At the corner of the arena, there's a ramp that goes up into the locker room. And it go, it's like it. The damn thing goes from, from here up to the corner. It's a long ramp, and the locker rooms are, are on either side at the end of the ramp. And about 30 seconds ago, I'm saying to myself, get Cheney and have the team run past UCLA up that ramp. We got them down by 15. They're going to have their heads down. Uh, let's just blow right by them up to the ramp and show them that we haven't even started yet. But something happens, I, you know, I'm sure some official made a bad call or whatever, and, and, and as little as I get interested in that, perhaps that time I did, but it slips my mind to make this comment to Calvin. The gun goes off to end the half. The UCLA players are a little bit ahead of us prior to going up the ramp. They start up the ramp, and Greg Graham and Cheney, without any 
thing from me or anybody else, all of a sudden just lead the team at a sprint past UCLA. The game's over with right then. And I think it came from my forcing them to make a decision and to assume some responsibility relative to being captain. And those two guys on their own just realized what it was they had to do. Wow, they went up there, came back, and we just destroyed them in the second half. So we got our players involved. We forced our players to get involved. We made a change. You know, I think that, that the leader, the manager, has got to be demanding. Now, we can all be demanding in different ways, but I want you to think back just a second and think back to when you were in school, as long, far back as you can remember, kindergarten, whatever, first grade, who was your best teacher? Who are the two best teachers that you ever had? And I'm willing to bet the farm that they are also the two most demanding teachers that you ever had. Now, they might not have been demanding with a chair and a whip, but they didn't accept anything other than your best. And every one of us, every one of us has had a teacher that was demanding, that made us give our best, ought to thank God we had that teacher. Because they're the best. The most demanding teachers are the best teachers. I teach a class at the university. I'm the only coach left in the Big Ten and have been for a long time in either football or basketball that still teaches a course. Woody Hayes taught a course at Ohio State till the day that he left the university. And I figured if Woody can do it, I can do it. And this isn't a course that's like rocket science or nuclear physics. Or, you know, it's kind of a simple course, an hour and a half credit. It's a course in teaching. And I try to share with kids the things that I think are really important in teaching. And I ask these kids to write down the names of their two best teachers. Think back. Most of them are juniors in college that take my course. I've probably got somewhere between 80 and 100 kids in there. 60% male, 40% female. Write down their two teachers. Now I say write down the two teachers that demanded the most out of you as a student. Invariably, it's the same two people. So we talk about demands a little bit. And the fact that if you're going to be a leader, you've got to demand. You've got to be able to make demands. Then I say, okay, now how many of you people had a coach you didn't like? All of you probably participated in some kind of sport in high school. How many of you had a coach you didn't like? Well, I'm the only coach in there, and there's no one else in there but me and these 90 kids. And it's always a girl that has the courage to raise her hand first, telling me that, well, I did have a coach I didn't like. You know, despite the fact that you're a coach, I had one I didn't like, and pretty soon, Every hand in the room is up. Now, be honest with me. How many of you had a coach you didn't? Every hand is up. And I make them keep their hands up and say, don't put your hands down. You didn't have a coach you didn't like? Well, get your hand up. So I got 90 kids with their hands up telling me, hey, you know, we don't buy everything you coaches say. And so I look over my group of 90 students and I say, here's your first lesson in teaching. We don't like all you little bastards either. <laughs> and I mean the stunned looks on faces when I say this. That's not fair. I mean, we can dislike you, but you can't dislike us. And then I talk a little bit about personalities, and I talk a little bit about teaching, and I talk a little bit about there's a big difference in being liked and being respected. You don't have to like everybody that you play for, and you don't have to like everyone that plays for you. And to be demanding 
I think the major prerequisite is that you're not interested in winning a popularity contest. When decisions are based on who will be the least upset or what decision can I make that will be most favorably accepted, then we're going to make bad decisions. When I became the head coach at the Military Academy at West Point, I was 24 years old. And within a week after I was named the head coach, I visited a great, great coach named Joe Lapchick. He had played with one of the first two original great basketball teams. There were two great basketball teams in New York back in the 20s. One was an all-black team called the New York Rams, the Renaissance sponsored by Kate Smith, the singer. Another was an all-white team called the Original Celtics, mostly Jewish players, with the exception of Lapchick and one or two others. They were the first two great basketball teams in America. And Lapchick was the center on this great Celtic team, the Original Celtics. And he later became a great coach at St. John's and a great coach with the Knicks and then back to St. John's. And, and until he retired in 1965, perhaps the most revered coach that I had ever known until I became acquainted and a friend of Henry Ivan. And Mr. Lapchick was very good to me because he liked and admired my college coach, Fred Taylor. And so in that first week, after I became the head coach at West Point, I went down to see Mr. Lapchick, who had a sixth grade education. Yet he had three children, all of whom went on to have PhDs. And Mr. Lapchick, with his sixth grade education, was one of the most articulate people I've ever known. And I asked him about coaching and teaching and all kinds of questions. And in the process, he looked at me in his living room at 3 Wendover Road in the Bronx. He looked at me and he said, let me ask you a question. Is it important to you that people like you? And I thought for a second, And I said, no. I said, Coach, it really isn't. It's important to me that people believe I know what I'm doing, that, that people have a confidence in decisions that I might make, but I don't think I can make the right decisions if it's important to me that people like me. Is that correct? And he said, if you want to coach, if you want to manage, if you want to lead, then you can't worry about people liking you. And I think that's a very, very big key in demanding. I think that you've really got to be organized to be a leader, to be a coach. I think organization is really important. And a part of organization is appearance. I think that when you meet with your team, you have to look and act like you know what the hell you're doing. I mean, how many of you have ever heard a guy get up to speak, even if it's impromptu, and if he's just been asked, and he gets up and says, I'm not sure why I'm here. Uh, I don't really know what I was asked to say, why I was asked to speak tonight. You no, know, I'm not sure what to say. Well, get your ass off there then. You know, what the hell are you doing up there in the first place? If they ask you to speak and you don't have anything to say, say, no, I don't have anything to say. You know, act like you know what you're doing. Look like you know what you're doing. We talk a lot about winning and losing. All these books are written about winning most by people who've never won in anything. 
You know, the, the, the writers always amuse me. The writers of books greatly amuse me. In almost all cases, they are observers, not doers. They observe other people and then critique other people, and they probably couldn't beat anybody at anything. I'm, I'm always interested with the guy that, that has all the theories. When I coached the Olympic team in 1984, a very, very prominent sports psychologist wanted to test the Olympians in basketball to see how I should handle them. And I told him that if I couldn't figure out how to handle them, they'd made a mistake in making me the coach. And it really upset him that I wouldn't let him work with the team. Because after all, he was a sports psychologist for the Dallas Cowboys. And the Dallas Cowboys were in the process of going to five Super Bowls, two of which they won. This is when Landry was coaching. And this guy thought he had a tremendous amount to do with the Dallas Cowboys, but I also knew that in addition to working with the Dallas Cowboys, he was spending just as much time with the Chicago Cubs. So now you tell me about sports psychology with the Chicago Cubs. And I think that, that as we learn to demand from our players, and as we get the respect of our players, and, and we're able to get our players to, to perform in a way that maybe they didn't think they could do before. The greatest compliment that you can ever have is, boy, he got more out of me than I thought I had to give. And to me, I kind of think that's the greatest reward that you can have in management, the greatest reward that you can have in coaching. If, if you're going to be a leader, you have to be organized. You have to look like you know what you're doing. You have to sound like you know what you're doing. And then pretty quickly, you got to know what you're doing. Because the way you look and the way you sound isn't going to carry it very far beyond the surface. The organized person, the person that is able to list what I've got to do today, how I've got to do it and get it done. The person who tonight can reflect back upon today and say, I had to do A, B, C, D, and E, and I didn't get D done. Why didn't I? Pogo gave us one of the great lines of all time. We has identified the enemy and they is us. I think organization involves keeping track of what it is that we have to do, getting it done, making sure that we know what it is that we have to do. Not, God, I can't think. Write it down. I don't think there's anything better for a guy that's a coach than to have a pad in his pocket so he writes something down. No, I got to call so-and-so to deliver packaging. Make sure I get it done. I've got a dictaphone. I talk into a lot to make sure I get things done. I don't want to, what is it that I've got? God, I can think of two things, but there are two other things I can't think of. I don't think anybody is capable of keeping track of everything that one has to do as a manager. Write it down. Time. God, there isn't anything to me that's more important in organization than the use of time. There's a great line in the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. Your computations, people say, have led the world to better reckoning. Nay, tis but the striking from the calendar of unborn tomorrow and dead yesterday. Now, I do a lot of things with our players. I, 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 enthusiasm. The leader has got to have enthusiasm. I mean, I want to be enthusiastically critical. God damn it, we can't do this. Or, boy, that was a hell of a block out. I was 
was going to use Evans as an example, but he didn't block out very well. That was a hell of a block out. That's what we've got to have. I think Norman Vincent Peale had a great line, enthusiasm makes a difference. Enthusiasm and understanding the game. The manager has to understand the game. Is it sales? Is it marketing? If it's sales, it's presentation, it's knowledge. If it's marketing, I sure as hell have to understand our competition. I've got to understand this area, that area, this product, where it can best be located. Paying attention to the game, understanding it is really important if I'm going to coach well. Sometimes it's tough. We've lost two in a row. And I gotta understand a little bit. I can't just say, well, we're gonna eventually win. Yeah, we'll eventually win, but we'll be done by then. How about walking into my locker room? We've just lost two in a row and you're playing for me and you see a big sign on the board. When you're up to your ass in alligators, remind yourself that your initial objective was to drain the swamp. We've just lost two in a row. We're up to our ass in alligators. And we better get the swamp drained. I really like to give messages to players. I like to let players know exactly what it is that I want done. Goals performance, input in so far as effectiveness and intensity is concerned. I may put Webster's definition of intensity on the board. I'm constantly trying to do something in our locker room where our players know that I'm constantly trying to do something. They've got to know that I am really involved. And I try to do some things to remind myself of what's important to me. Time. I put together some things on time. And I'll just quickly go through a couple of them with you. Time is man's most important asset. All men neglect it. All regret the loss of it. Nothing can be done without it. Voltaire. Dost thou love life? then do not squander time, for that's the stuff of which life is made. Benjamin Franklin. Time is the scarcest resource, and unless it is managed, nothing else matters. I talked a little bit about enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, that certain something that makes us great that pulls us out of the mediocre and commonplace, that builds us into power. Enthusiasm, if we have it, we should thank God for it. If we don't have it, then we should get down on our knees and pray for it. I try to teach that you can do something wrong enthusiastically and it'll turn out right. You can execute something in the right technique without enthusiasm and you lose the play. Enthusiasm makes the difference. And then the last point that I would make relative to leadership would be flexibility. Now, I'm not looked upon as the most flexible individual in America. I understand that. But I understand the importance of flexibility. I understand the necessity to change from an inside attack to an outside attack. I understand the necessity to handle a kid differently today than I might tomorrow. I don't think there's any given set of circumstances that we can apply from our team or to our team from one day to the next without seeing exactly what tomorrow brings. One of the great things they teach in golf is that when the pro tour player goes to the golf course and he practices before the day's round, he takes that game out on the course with him. He's kind of fading the ball, 
somehow he's not getting through it. Instead of fighting to change that, play with that today. When today's over, we have to work to change it. But you, I think, have got to really be a flexible leader if you're going to be an effective leader. I walked into the locker room after the first half of our game with Spain in 1984 for the gold medal. We're ahead by 29 points. We've played basketball as well as the game can be played. Michael Jordan has played 12 minutes out of the 20. He has 11 rebounds, 9 assists, and 19 points in 12 minutes. In my opinion, there's nobody that's ever played anything that can compare to Michael Jordan with the possible exception of Jack Nicklaus and Babe Ruth. Michael Jordan is just the best there ever was at what he does by a considerable margin. So I'm walking across the floor with this 29 point lead as I look at the scoreboard and I'm a great believer in the best three minutes of the game for us has got to be the first three minutes of the second half. But what the hell am I going to say? Hey, we got to get better. We're 29 points ahead. We got to win by 59. These kids are going to be a little bit satisfied with themselves. They know how well they play. And when I get to the locker room, I still haven't come up with an answer. I open the door, and the first guy I see is Jordan sitting in front of his locker. Idea light flashes. I say to myself, I'm going to get on Jordan's ass a little bit. And everybody else is going to say, God, if he's upset with Jordan, how's he feel about me? 12 minutes, 19 points, 11 rebounds, 9 assists, and I have the stat sheet in my hand, and I walk over in front of Jordan, and I look down at him, and I say, Mike, when the hell are you going to set a screen? We got four guys out there screening when you're in the game, screening to get you open, screening to get each other open. Haven't seen you set a screen yet. The only way I get all five guys screening, Mike, is to get you the hell out of the game. Now, when are you going to set a screen? All you've been doing so far, goddammit, is rebounding, passing, and scoring. You need to screen, Mike. Now, Jordan, you've all seen the grin. I mean, it's the greatest grin in the world. Doesn't quite use all of his grin in this circumstance. But he looks up at me and he grins a little bit and he says, Coach, didn't I see last week where you said I was the quickest player you'd ever been around? I said, Mike, what the hell has that got to do with you screening? Coach, I think I'm setting them quicker than you can see them out there. <laughs> Well, I was flexible enough to look at Jordan and say, then, God damn it, slow him down a little bit so I can see him. <laughs> These are the things that I think have to go in to being a leader. And we're all going to make mistakes in leadership positions. We aren't all going to make the right decisions. Wayne isn't going to pick the right jockey in the Preakness. Wayne's going to drop Pat Day to give Bailey a ride. But, let me tell you two things about that decision. Pat Day is as good a jockey as there is in the country. And Bailey is too. And Bailey rode Wayne's horse in the Kentucky Derby. What kind of great loyalty is that on the part of the trainer, on Wayne's part, to take it upon himself to drop Pat Day and give Bailey the ride because Bailey's horse was scratched from the race. Now, I thought that was a tremendous tribute to Wayne and his loyalty to Bailey. Pat Day goes on and rides the winning horse in the Preakness. 
mean, that's just one of those things. What I have never seen written or talked about was Wayne's loyalty to Bailey. And Bailey deserved, having ridden the Derby winner, to have one of Wayne's horses in the Preakness. I thought that was a great thing that Wayne did. How about this? In the recent U.S. Open last week, one of our kids, Randy Lean from Dayton, who's a sophomore, got into the Open when Freddie Couples had to withdraw with a bad back. Called Sam Carmichael, our coach. Sam Carmichael is the same age as I am, 55. And Sam went up to Oakland Hills and caddied four days for Randy Lean. 55 years old, tugging that bag. Sam hadn't walked 18 holes since Mother Teresa was a missionary. <laughs> and here he is, carrying this kid's bag. 19 years old, Sam's carrying the bag for four days. I mean, how hard do you think that kid will play for Sam Carmichael the next two years? I mean, in all of the things that we talk about, and all of the things that we talk about relative to leadership, perhaps the most important of all might be loyalty to the players that we have who see, who listen, and who perform. I've enjoyed being with you here this afternoon. Thank you. I, and I'll, I'll be glad to, I'll be glad to entertain uh, uh, questions. Uh, I've got nowhere to go. Uh, so if you've got questions, uh, just stand and, and uh, go to a mic and ask them, and if they're good questions, I'll answer them. If they're bad ones, I'll just ignore them, and we'll go on to the next guy. Now, anybody that wants to start off with a really intelligent question, go right ahead. Coach, in Sun Tzu's book, The Art of War, what was the most important or valuable thing that you gained out of that? I mentioned all of these books that have been written about how to win and, and how to succeed and how to do this and how to do that. When I write a book, it's going to be entitled Losing. Because I think knowing how to lose is really important. I mean, everybody wants to win. You know, when it's thrown up, we all want to win. But you got to know what losing is all about to win, I think. You eliminate the reasons why you lose. Poor communication, poor grammar, poor appearance lack of knowledge, being late, whatever it is that you're involved with, list the reasons why you lose, and then eliminate them. God damn, there's only one choice left. I think understanding losing is really important, and we eliminate those reasons why we lose. The best book I think ever written on success or how to succeed was written 500 years before the birth of Christ, by a Chinese militarist named Sun Tzu. That's the book he was referring to. And I'll take just one passage from the book because it was the first passage I ever learned in the book. Just as water retains no constant shape, so too in war are there no constant conditions. He who best understands this may be a heaven-born captain talks about a lot of things, understanding the game, flexibility, observation. But this is a book, if you're interested in the whole realm of books on winning and success that have been written, go to your bookstore and have them order you a copy of The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Coach, this is a two-part question. I uh, own a small business over in Cincinnati, and over the years I've had to deal with employees that want to be rewarded for simply doing what is is, is, is uh, expected of them. Uh, what's your feeling on that, and also how would you manage people like that? Well, first of all, I think that that you have uh, you have to let your people know. Let's let's just take a quarter, if we might. You have to let your people know what's expected of them this quarter. 
And when they reach that, that's what's been expected of them. We got our job done. We did it. That's what you were paid to do. Now, perhaps they've gone way over that, and now maybe you have a little bit of an incentive plan. But I think an incentive plan isn't for what you're paying me to do X. And if I do X plus, then maybe in your mind, something additional should be done for me. But I've got to be told that, and I've got to be aware of that. And I think you have to uh, be very straightforward in that. We're not just paying you to be here. We're not paying you to fill. We're paying you to do X. And if we get X done, that's what the hell you've been paid to do. Now, if we do Y and Z, now we're talking about something a little bit extra because that's a little bit more than I expected. Uh, it's a little bit more than, than, than I expected to get out of the quarter, so you deserve to have a little bit more, perhaps, than you expected. But I think that's something that has to be set up as you go into the, the quarter, the year, uh, semi-annually, uh, however it is that, that you set it up. And then I think you have a real understanding uh, of what you, you have goals, uh, you have set limits that you're trying to get to, and when you get to those limits or you get to those goals or you get beyond, then other things uh, are available. That's like, um, I have never uh, accepted, we've won the Big Ten Championship either 11 or 12 times, and I think that's what the hell I'm getting paid to do. You know, so I have never accepted anything uh, like a car, a boat, a fishing rod, because that's not, and, and yet I see that happen a lot. And, and those are people that, in my opinion, have not been made aware initially of what's expected of them. And I, I don't know whether that uh, answers what you're talking about. That would be the way I would handle it. How do you deal with those people? How do you deal with people that, that do what's expected of them and then want more for them, I'd just find somebody else. I mean, I'm not going to have a guy here. You're getting paid to do this. Uh, last year, we didn't get this done, and I didn't take anything out of your pay. This is what you're paid to do. Now, you get beyond that, and, and, I always, and I always think there's a little bit of a, a really difficult area here also in promotion. You know, some people just shouldn't be promoted because they're too damn good at what they do. And I think another part of management is recognizing that and also knowing that this guy isn't going to be as good if we promote him to this job as he is here. And I think you've got to be tough enough to bring him in and say, John, let me tell you something. Based on what you've done, you deserve to be promoted from C to B, but I'm not going to do it. Because you're too good at what you do, I'm just going to pay you what B gets to stay here at C. And we've saved both of us a hell of a lot of problems because John isn't capable of what all is entailed to be. And now I'm going to have problems with a guy who is really, really good at C. Translate that to basketball, it's a kid that doesn't shoot very well. And I don't let him shoot nearly as much as his dad thinks he should be shooting. But you know, I didn't write his dad a letter and tell him how to sell insurance either. Your value to us is playing defense and handling the ball without making mistakes. You don't need to be a shooter. You're just going to stay right where you are. Now the kid's a senior. You know, he thinks, boy, I'm a senior. Hey, I just recruited two freshmen that can shoot better than you can. So that's uh, always an interesting uh, aspect, I think, of leadership and dealing with people. Coach, uh, how do you view the uh, recent professional player salary demands for people like Shaquille O'Neal, Reggie Miller, Michael Jordan, and some of these? Well, it, it's like people ask me, uh, haven't kids changed a lot? Oh boy, how do you deal with kids today? Well, I think parents have changed a lot. I don't think that parents my age have been as good as parents 
my dad's age. I don't think parents my son's age are as good as parents my age in being demanding of kids. I think a lot of it just starts with, with parental demand and instead of the parents saying, this is the way it's going to be, too many parents have adopted this philosophy of, well, that's okay, Johnny, everything's positive reinforcement. Well, everything isn't uh, roses. And, and the same thing with salary demands. The, the problem with salary demands is there's going to be a guy that pays it. And, and that's where it, I think, gets out of hand. They even try, they try to legislate and help weaker people by putting a salary cap on things. But what does some guy do? He tries to figure out a way to beat the salary cap. So the people that are actually paying out the money, I think, are the people that are more at fault for the salaries that are being paid than those who are demanding the salary. Now, if Shaquille O'Neal makes wants to make $25 million a year, then put an incentive in there that for every game that he doesn't shoot 70% from the free throw line, it costs him $10,000. I mean, that, that, I think, would be fair. You know what? Somebody just told me today that, that I think his contract demand, or his contract demand was $37,000 a day. I mean, well, it seems to me reasonable to believe that the guy to make a free throw occasionally. <laughs> Coach, has uh, how you motivate your players today, as opposed to when you started your career, has that changed? And can you find the type of player in today's society that? that was a commonplace for you in the start of your career, like a Buckner, a kid that was really well, tough I, like I, that? I think that we really can. I think that, uh, you know, we have not been as nationally competitive for three seasons as I would like us to be. But I think we finished second, third, and second in the Big Ten during those three years. Uh, prior to that, we'd won it 11 or 12 times. Uh, I want to want to get us back to where we're as good as anybody in the country. Um, we've beaten teams that are very good during these three years. We've won 60 games. I mean, we've done some things that are pretty good. That I but I'm really not satisfied because we haven't been pretty good over the years. We've been very good, and yet I don't think that uh, is a reflection on the kind of kid that we have today. Um, uh, nearly as much as perhaps we haven't had. Uh, enough kids or we've needed another guard or we've been a little bit short here or a little bit short there which we're trying to uh, which we're trying to correct uh, I don't feel that we are at at any uh, disadvantage at all compared to at any time in the past as to the kind of kid that's available to us not just available generally but to av available to us in Indiana I like the kids that we have as incoming freshmen uh, I like the kids that, that we are recruiting for the next couple of years. And I think there are kids that are going to be able to do what it is that we want done. I think part of that, though, is that as time has passed, there have just been more and more and more kids that can play. And consequently, as the total numbers have increased, so too have the numbers that are going to appeal to us. Coach, uh, you address the uh, early entry into the NBA doesn't hurt the colleges, but do you think it really helps the players? No, and if, I, I, and if they knew that they couldn't, uh, I, I'm not saying you agreed, but if you knew, if they knew that they had to finish or had to go through three years or whatever, that then they would. But, for, but there's no try way more. you can require them to do that. I mean, this is free enterprise. You know, you've got a certain skill, and we can't tell you that you can only work east of the Mississippi River. And, and that's essentially what you're doing here. Somebody has got to convince the kids that you're not ready, either, either emotionally or physically, but that's hard to convince kids. Kids think they're really good. I mean, like Bo and I were talking, Bo asked me last night, he said, you remember when you were a kid at Ohio State, he was an assistant at Ohio State. Do you remember when you were a kid at Ohio State and you came in to see me and you thought you should have been 
playing more on a basketball team and you weren't, and you were playing a hell of a lot as it was, and he said, in fact, I think if you'll remember, I told you that you were playing more than you would have been if I was coaching, and, and, uh, and you kind of went away and you felt a little bit better because I had you convinced that you were playing a lot, and in fact, I was, and, and he said, that's kind of like... Uh, when I was at Miami, he said, oh, damn it, when I was a sophomore, I thought I should have been the starting right tackle at Miami. And God damn it, I still think so today. Well, kids think always that they're just a little bit better than they are. And so the kid that, that is pretty good may think he's really a lot better than he is. Or maybe he can't transfer the circumstances of his playing in college to what it's going to be like in the pros in a realistic way. So those kids always get hurt by it. And, and they leave and they go and see we do one thing that's wrong right now and, and uh, uh, we let a kid announce for the pros, see where he's going to be drafted and if he doesn't like it he comes back to college. Now I'd have a hell of a time coaching that kid. You know, I would have to say, look, you've got a decision to make. You're either going to go to the pros or you're not. You're either pregnant or you aren't. They're in a halfway. And, and you're going to go uh, or you're not going to go because you're not coming back here. Uh, and, and we make a mistake. See, that would deter some kids. You know, a kid would say, well, I'm not going to take a chance on it. I've got another year and I've got to play. But it's tough with these kids. Somebody gets a hold of them, a family member, uh, some guy that they don't even know and, and convinces them that, well, you're going to get to shoot more in the pros. You're going to be the pros think, the pros think, the pros, well, they don't. And, and that will always be the problem. See, they have a big problem with agents right now, or the NCAA thinks there's a big problem with agents. Well, you eliminate agents by making representation for a professional contract part of the scholarship the kid gets for attending any institution. So in our situation, I just get three or four guys who are attorneys and really willing to help our players volunteer their services to any of our players that are capable of signing a professional contract so it doesn't cost them anything. And now you virtually eliminate agents by doing that. But the NCAA will not, by the year 2050, come up with, with that as a solution. Well, as I said, uh, I've enjoyed being with you. What, what we've simply tried to do uh, today uh, is let you uh, listen to and then ask questions of some people uh, that haven't written books or made tapes but that have made decisions and built teams just like you have to build teams or you have to run a department uh, you have to make decisions you have to bring in new people you have to eliminate old people and 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 I, I believe that we have brought uh, uh, five people here prior to me that that have been outstanding uh, in doing what all of us have to do uh, in any walk of life. And I hope that you have all really enjoyed uh, what has been presented to you today uh, and the work put into it. And on behalf of all of us, uh, let me just tell you that we appreciate uh, you being here today. Have a nice summer. Thank you.